WPA3, SIE, and ECC. It was this place three years ago where I finished my 10 talk with the conclusion that WPA2 personal was never designed to protect against decryption by a passive attacker only listening who knows a pre-shared key. Although these technologies were available at that time and WPA3 personal added or replace the open authentication with a SAE handshake that adds another new key exchange to protect against this attack. And this talk is about this handshake. With only 10 minutes, there will be some simplifications, but it should be okay to get the idea behind it. Key exchanges are typically done with public key cryptography nowadays. And there we need to make sure that the attacker cannot calculate the key two parties agreed on, and we need to make sure that the attacker cannot calculate the private key based on the known public key. So we have a trapdoor function, a one-way function to make this work. We have an operation that is extremely hard to impossible in one direction, and if needed, easy in the other direction. Nowadays, we use elliptic curve cryptography for this. ECC dates back to 1985, so just eight to nine years after the original Diffie-Hellman key exchange, but working with elliptic curves is much older. Diophantis of Alexandria did it 1,800 years ago, working on that. So what is an elliptic curve? We have an equation, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. And if we use the values minus one and nine for a and b, we get this beautiful curve. And Diophantus was interested in finding rational points on this curve. And if we use the coordinates x1 and y th equal three, we see that this is a point on the curve because the equation is true. And we see that the curve has a symmetry. If we have a point at y equal three, there's also a point on y equals minus three. To qualify for a cryptographic system, there are some more characteristics that need to be fulfilled, but doing math on it is one of it. And we can add points. We have an addition. If we have two points, A and B, we can add them together, and we do it by drawing a line through these two points, and it will cross the curve at a third point. This point gets reflected down because we have the symmetry, and that is point C. We can add point C to point A. Same operation, we get to point D. We also have point doubling, or also named uh, multiplication. If we want to add A to itself, the operation is a little bit different. We just take the point and draw a tangent line on the curve at point A, and it will cross the curve at another point. We reflect this point down, and we get to point two times A. We can add A to it, we get to the point three times A. And no animation for that. We could also double point two times A to get to point four times A. We can double to point four times A to get to point eight times A. So why does this matter? This doubling and adding of points is really easy. It can be done very fast. But if we have a point A, and we want to get to a point, or, and we get to a point n times a, even if the n is really huge, is easy. But the attacker who only has the point a and the point n times a will never get to the number n. And that is our trapdoor function. The point n times a is like a public key, and the number n is like a private key. Um, oh, no time for that. So why do we use elliptic curve cryptography for this where we have the traditional Diffie-Hellman algorithm that works great? Well, if the attacker wants to calculate the key that two parties agreed on, he has to solve the computational Diffie-Hellman problem. And the algorithms for this get more efficient the longer the key sizes. So we need really large keys which make our operation slow to get a sufficient security. If we use Diffie-Hellman with an elliptic curve implementation, we have a similar, very similar operation to the traditional Diffie-Hellman. We choose a point on the curve, 
This is point P. Alice and Bob generate a random number small a or small b and calculate the point A times P or the point B times P, which is our public key. That gets exchanged and both can calculate the shared key that an eavesdropper cannot calculate. And with elliptic curve cryptography, the amount of time the attacker has to invest in breaking this grows nearly exponentially with a key length. And we can use Keith up about 250 bits, bit, uh, 256 bit length, which is much, much faster. Um, this is a good reading if you like stuff like this. So WPA3 again. If you take this elliptic curve to Fehelman key exchange and add an authentication element, because elliptic uh, Diffie-Hellman by itself is not authentication, authenticated, we get to an algorithm like Dragonfly. And a modified version of Dragonfly is used in our WPA3 SAE handshake. It's not the same, but it's similar enough to take Diffie-Hellman as a reference, it's included there, to look at the way it works. In SAE, we use a password on the SSID, map it to a curve, and generate or calculate two values. A scalar, which is similar to a pub to the public key, and a field element, which is similar to the first point on the curve. And these two values get exchanged in the first two packets of our SAE handshake. We have the, oh, the commit phase, two packets, and we have the confirm phase, again, two packets. And these are the packets that we exchange. The client send, the scalar, the finite field element, the two values for our Diffie-Hellman implementation. The access point sends the same. And we have a group ID. And here it says 256-bit random ECP group number 19. Both peers need to agree on the same curve. And the curve here is a 256 bit random elliptic curve group, which gives us a 120-bit eight security level. There are even more secure options, but uh, 256 bit is mandatory. And there are even legacy options with legacy cryptography. But I'm not aware that any vendor has implemented that. The numbers, 19 and so on, are the same as are used with Internet Key Exchange, which makes it a little bit easier for administrators working on both technologies. Well, after these first two packets have been exchanged, both peers can generate, can calculate a new key that the eavesdropper cannot calculate. And this shared key is used to generate the per session per wise master key. The next two packets are confirm packets. The client and the access point confirm to each other that you generated the same key, that they did the operation correctly. And when these two packets are done, the SAE handshake is over, and we continue with the normal operation on our Wi-Fi setup. We have our association, we have our four-way key handshake, and we are done. And I'm on time. Whoa. That's it. <laughs>